will be فهو في الآخرة أعمى وأضل سبيلا that person will be resurrected blind in the Akhirah and more confused and more astray from the right way, from the path, from Jannah. So the person who chose not to look at the truth in this dunya will have no choice but to be blind in the Akhirah. They will not be able to see the angels. They will not be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not be able to see the realities of Jannah. They will not be able to even see subhanAllah or enter Jannah or smell Jannah. Can you imagine, yani, what a, yeah, yani, subhanAllah, you think about it this way. One of the biggest blessings of entering Jannah, actually the biggest blessing of entering Jannah, is to see what's inside Jannah. Being able to actually encounter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's face. Meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Encountering that divine presence. That's an amazing moment. It's beyond the capacity. Meeting your creator. Imagine being deprived of that. The ayat لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً for the people of Ihsan, they get husna, which is Jannah, and ziyada and extra. What's the extra? What's better than Jannah? What's extra? The extra on top. The scholars of Tafsir say the ziyada is being able to see and converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what awaits in Jannah. And imagine being deprived. You had the ability to see the truth. You saw it, you recognized it, but you chose to be blind in this dunya. So what happens? You're, de you're deprived and you become blind in the akhara. You don't get to see any of that. So may Allah protect us. Then Allah says, giving us an example. A lot of us are blinded in this dunya by the many lusts and desires and amb ambitions that we have that blind us from seeing the truth. Right? Think about Fir'aun. We talked about this last time. He was blinded by his power. It doesn't matter what he saw, whatever sign, he would reinterpret it. So he would see Musa you know, throw the staff down. Oh, it's magic. He would see the magicians prostrate. Oh, it's a conspiracy. He would see, uh, you know, Musa cross over the sea. Oh, it's ma everything becomes magic, a conspiracy because he doesn't want to admit he's blinded by his power. I don't want to lose that power. So sometimes we have things in our life that blind us from seeing the truth, from seeing reality as it should. So Allah gives us an example of those moments in the Prophet Muhammad's life where, where he could have been swayed or blinded in the smallest of ways, but Allah protected him to show us that none of us is immune. So Allah says, وَإِن كَادُوا لَيَفْتِنُونَكَ عَنِ الَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ لِتَفْتَرِيَ عَلَيْنَا غَيْرَهُ وَإِذَا لَتَّخَذُوكَ خَلِيلًا And they definitely tried to lure you away from what has been revealed to you, O Messenger of Allah, hoping that you would attribute something false to us, to Allah. And in that case, they would have certainly taken you as a close friend. What is this talking about? So we're talking about Ayah 83. What is this talking about? The scholars of tafsir, like Sa'id ibn Jubayr and Qatada and Mujahid and others, they say, subhanAllah, that the Prophet Muhammad one day was doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And he came very close to touching the black stone. But back then, there were certain limitations that the Quraysh placed on the Prophet and his family. One of those limitations, they could not touch the black stone. Right? Nobody could buy from them, sell from them. Nobody could marry or intermarry from them. And Abu Lahab forced the Prophet Muhammad Sallam's son-in-law, Ud bin Utaybah, to divorce. So all of these social pressures, boycotts, financial pressures. One of the other pressures, religiously, you cannot stop someone from being in the house of Allah, but you can stop them from touching the black stone. So one day as he's doing the tawaf around the Kaaba, they came to him and they told him, look, we'll allow you to touch the black stone. All that we want is just touch also the other gods in the process. So along the way to get to the black stone, there are other gods around the Kaaba. Touch one or two or three and will allow you to touch the black stone. So he thought to himself, well, my intention is not to touch the, the you know, my intention in touching, it, it's not coupled by anything. I have no respect, no sanctity associated with these beings. So I can touch it and just, it's okay. The intention is, is, is not there. So it should be fine. It was, a, it was a thought. And then, of course, the thabat came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't even touch it. Don't. The thabat comes from the angels, the positive whispers. Allah protects His prophets, right? In Allah yudafu an alladhina amanu. Allah protects the people of Iman and the people of um, the, the people who have chosen Him to be their number one. You know, Allah inna awliya Allahi la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Alladhina amanu wa kanu yattaqun. Lahumul bushra fil hayat al-dunya wa fil akhirah. 
So there are these people that get to that level. The Quran is very clear. Prophets, messengers, and people follow in their footsteps of humility, dignity, and, and commitment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger could have touched the other gods and then touched the black stone. So they continued to try to sway him in these little things. For example, they came to him as we know, and they said, look, we'll worship your God one year, and you worship our God one year. Let's compromise. Let's meet halfway in between. And then the ayah was revealed. There is no chance. I will not worship what you worship. You will never worship what I worship. I will not worship what you worship. That's lakum dinukum waliyadin. Unto you is your way, unto me is my way. So there was no compromise when it comes to tawheed. There was no compromise. The Prophet Muhammad was given that thabat, stay firm upon tawheed. Right? Many other examples. They said, we can give you power and money. We can get you married to whoever you want. We can do this and this and this and that. But he said, no. All of these, and, and it wasn't just once. You can, you, you can have the energy to say no once. It was constant. They, 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 you know when you're, they would play good cop, bad cop with the Prophet They would bully him and then send someone with a small ounce of, you know, a small ounce of hope to see if he's going to bite. So one example where they, um, you know, they sent him, one of the leaders, and he was engaging in tafkhim. Oh, you are Sayyidina. You are our master. You do so good. You have such great words. But just take it easy on us. Khafif alayna. You know, take it easy with some of these rules. Instead of, you know, the idol. Let's meet. Let's take it. It's okay. You know that. Let's make, make things easy a little. No need to be halal mode all the time. You know, the... So that attitude, subhanAllah. And they would come to the Prophet ﷺ and they would say, for example, um, as, as mentioned by also Sa'id ibn Jubayr, he said that the people of Ta'if came to the Prophet ﷺ and they told him, Ya O Messenger of God. So they used the O Messenger of God. That indicates what? We're actually willing to believe in, in the fact that you're the Messenger of God. So look, we're willing to support you socially, religiously, politically, under one condition. You make a sacred space in Ta'if just like there is a sacred space in Mecca. So you know how you have a haram, Kaaba, in Mecca? We just want like that, that's all. No big deal. That's all, that's the only thing. And we'll support you. So the Prophet Muhammad could have easily, you know, made it up. Okay, fine, yeah, okay, okay. Here you go. But he said, it's not up to me. I can't decide what Allah considers to be sanctified, what Allah considers to be sacred. So all of these little offers, these little attempts to reconcile, to compromise, came from the Prophet ﷺ, and the Quran, uh, came to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Quran mentions this in Surah Noon, uh, Surah Al-Qalam. What does Allah say? What do law to dhinu fayudhinun? They wish, they desire that you give a little bit, that you compromise a little, so that they would compromise a lot. They just want you to compromise on a few things. Tawheed, you just compromise a little bit on Tawheed, that's it. They'll be your best friends. Literally, it says, They would have taken you as a, what's a Khalil? Very close friend. Very close friend. So sometimes in life, you will have these opportunities. Somebody will come be like, oh, I see the talent that you have. You'd be such a great this, you'd be such a great that. There's just a few things that you, you have to do. It's just part of the industry. It's, part of, it's just the expectation. If only you do these things, I can make a star out of you. I can make this out. It happens, subhanAllah. And these are the, these are the decisions that we make in our day-to-day. -day. Are we going to remain firm upon what we know to be true? Or are we going to compromise with the intention, hey, Allah forgives, you know, it's, it's okay, I'll turn back. I'll repent back later in my life. Right? And think about the way that we normalize and naturalize these things in our minds by saying it's not the act that counts, it's the intention. We do that all the time. It's not the act, it's the intention. You know, it's, it's okay. This attitude. And Nabi Sallam did not say, okay, I'm touching the idol, but as I'm touching it, I'm actually invoking the curse of Allah upon it. It's, no, he, because, what, because what happens to everybody else who sees you doing that? It's not about what you have in your heart only. It's about how it's inferred, how it's understood, and the public meaning, the endorsement and the interpretation and the message that it could send to the general, to the community. And the intention behind the one who's asking you to do it. Asking you to make the compromise. So these are questions that we need to think, subhanAllah, to ourselves. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
ولولا أن ثبتناك لقد كت تركن إليهم شيئا قليلا and had it not been Allah subhanahu wa taala giving you the ability to remain steadfast you would have inclined to them a little bit had it not been Allah who gave you the ability to remain steadfast you would have inclined a little bit subhanallah that's a Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم so you never lean on yourself you lean on Allah subhanahu wa taala I gave this example before Yusuf. Yusuf, when he was tempted by Imrat al Aziz, he didn't say, ah, No, I'm too good for this. I would never do this. He said, What? Allah. Ya Allah, protect me. On my own, I can't. Through you, I can't. So, this idea that we are not strong enough in our own, yet we become fierceless when we derive that energy from Allah and that hope from Allah and that trust in Allah. When we live, Bismillah, the, the image that I give is imagine you show up to city hall as an individual okay you get treated like everybody else but if you show up with like the vip badge you're showing up with like the mayor or you're showing up with like the you know you're showing up on behalf of the prime minister's office you're gonna get a different treatment it's just the nature of things so who are you representing so when you come into this world by you, you like who are you but when you come in the name of allah bismillah you're now acting on behalf of Allah. You're representing Allah. You're saying, I'm coming and interacting with this in the name of Allah. And I'm invoking Allah's name, which gives you now the extra what, the extra privilege. But it comes with a responsibility. You got to behave like you are acting in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what a lot of people do. They eat, Bismillah, 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 they eat. But they're saying Bismillah, but they're not actually, you know, acting like they're representing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that they eat. Right? So it comes, you eat in front of you, you take it easy, you don't eat, you know, all of these etiquettes. So yes, it's an act of speech that you're invoking, but it needs to be followed by the behavior and the commitment and the, not just the privilege, also the responsibility. So Allah is telling the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, had it not been for Allah, you would not have had the thabat. You would have succumbed to the pressure. Peer pressure is real. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallam himself could have been peer pressure. But what makes a person remain firm? What makes a person remain standing, guys? How do you get to that thabat? A few ayat later, a few ayat later, we're going to hear what? أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِدُلُوكِ الشَّمْسِ إِلَىٰ غَسَقِ اللَّيْلِ وَقُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ إِنَّ قُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ كَانَ مَشْهُودًا وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدِ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا We get the, the, the answer. You establish your prayer at the decline of the sun. Uh, from the morning to the darkness of the night Quran al-Fajr and the recitation of the Quran and the Fajr praying Fajr inna Quran al-Fajr kana mashhuda that Fajr prayer will be witnessed by the angels you know there are two shifts of the angels and they meet at Fajr and they meet at Asr and they say how did you leave the people they say I left them upon this state and they take notes and they exchange notes so two salahs that you want to always be there for Fajr and Asr if you can because that's when the exchange happens and so being there and then praying at night when everybody else is sleeping the hajjud you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in private at night that's where you build your ability to stand the storms of this dunya that's where it comes from qiyan the hajjud standing at night alone when nobody else is looking will give you the ability to stand against the pressures of this dunya when everybody else is looking when all the pressure is on you to act or to make or to compromise, that's where you get the strength. The qiyam, the hajjud. And that's where the connection comes in. And that's what Nabi Sallallahu would do what? He would pray two-thirds of the night. إِنَّ رَبَّكَ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ تَقُومُ أَدْنَى مِنْ ثُلُثَيْ اللَّيْلِ وَنِصْفَهُ وَثُلُثَهُ وَطَائِفَةُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ مَعَكَ وَاللَّهُ يُقَدِّرُ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ عَلِمَ أَنْ سَيَكُونُ مِنْكُمْ مَرْضَى وَآخَرُونَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَآخَرُونَ يَضْرِبُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَآخَرُونَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي فَقَرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنْهُ وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهُ وَخَيْرٌ وَعَظَمَ أَجْرًا The ayat are there, subhanAllah, to tell us that Allah knows that you're praying two-thirds of the night or a little bit less or a little bit more. And whatever you give, whatever you provide, you will, you will reap it. You invest at night, you will reap it during the day. At the beginning of the surah, Surah Al-Muzzamil, what does Allah say? إِنَّ لَكَ فِي النَّهَارِ سَبَحًا طَوِيلًا You have all of these motions, motions in the day. You're so busy in the day. So what should you do? قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Stand at night. You'd think the opposite. I'm so busy in the day, I should rest at night. No, it's quite the opposite. 
So you give yourself a little bit, you rest, you know, four or five hours, and then you get up and you do your qiyam, you rest a little bit after that, that's fine, before Fajr, and you can rest and you take your midday nap, but the ability to stand at night and do qiyam will give you energy and clarity and strength that cannot be put and quantified in words. And it will give you this calm and demeanor and ease and just a sense of peace. You know, people just rushing, rushing, they, they don't just stay calm for a second. That, that grounding comes from qiyam. And one piece of advice, subhanAllah, is that yeah, one, maybe one of the best pieces of advice that I've received personally back and continue to receive and continue to share is if it means enough to you, you'll stand at night with Allah to ask Allah to bless it, to keep it, to protect it for you. So your children mean enough to you? You mean stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala night and ask Allah to bless your children. Your wife means something to you? Stand in front of Allah and ask Allah to protect your wife for you to protect your husband for you, to protect your parents for you. And whatever it is that you're seeking, if it's important to you, you'll make time to talk to Allah privately, directly about it. And why would you turn away that, turn down the offer? And one of the best ways, you know, subhanAllah, you know what happens, remember last time we talked about how when you fall into this web of sin, you lose your spiritual confidence, you lose your moral confidence. Right? You begin to say to yourself, like, I've made this mistake. Where do I get the confidence to tell other people not to do it? I've, fell, I've fallen into this sin. How can I tell people not to do it? So how do you rebuild that moral confidence in yourself? On behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You build that moral confidence and spiritual confidence again by doing the visual prayer, the, 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 the qiyam at night. That's where you rebuild that confidence in the qiyam. It's, it's literally, and imagine we call it qiyam. You're standing, yes, in the, in the night, but that is what keeps you standing. That's what keeps you standing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, and here's, here's the scary part, my brothers and my sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yani mentions um, among the things that they tried to do to tempt him or to try to sway the Prophet Muhammad is the people, of, the people, the Jewish community in Medina, according to the narration attributed to Ibn Abbas, and even though Ibn, Ibn Kathir himself questions the narration, it's still a valuable lesson to think about and to reconsider. What does he say? Ibn Abbas, it's attributed that he said that the, the, the Jewish communities said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallam that we are willing to believe in you as long as you make the intention or you make the journey away from Mecca and Medina and actually go towards the Sham, because the Sham is where all the other prophets and messengers were, the Israelite prophets and messengers. So leave Mecca, leave Medina, and just go to Jerusalem, and we're going to believe in you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. What's the ayah? Revealed the ayah right after, uh, where he says, وَإِن كَادُوا لَيَسْتَفِزُّونَكَ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ لِيُخْرِجُوكَ مِنْهَا وَإِذًا لَا يَلْبَثُونَ خِلَافَكَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They were actually trying to do this whole trick to get you to leave Mecca and Medina. And to try to actually plan a coup. Go to the Jerusalem. We're going to support you there. Yeah, yeah. But on that journey, there was an attempt to sabotage, an attempt to this, an attempt to that. And there was this plan to basically do a coup. Subhanallah. And another situation, other group said, leave Mecca, Medina, go to Tabuk. Okay, maybe not Sham, but let me meet, meet in between. Tabuk is still Byzantine territory. It's closer enough to the Sham so that we'll be able to visit you. It's closer enough to this that we'll be able to visit you. And then inshallah, we'll, we'll support you and then we'll, we'll be believers. But the Nabi Sallam was given that firmness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't go to Tabuk, don't go to Sham. Stay where you're supposed to finish your message. Allah will take it upon himself to share that message to the rest of the world when it's time. So all of these tricks that were attempted, you know, everything in between. And we know that they tried to assassinate him وسلم, in Mecca. And the plan that they came up with to, you know, drive him out of Mecca. There was the attempt as well. If you cannot, يعني, they're going to try to remove you out of Mecca. They're going to try to lock you in Mecca, cage you so you can't do anything. Or assassinate you altogether. And they plan, but Allah is the best of planners. So all of these attempts, they're going to try to sway him with money and power, with threats, with intimidation, all of these attempts. And imagine he has to navigate all of that and remain firm and remain committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's tough, but that's what this life is full of. Now maybe you're not dealing with people who are going to intimidate you and intimidate or threaten your life. Maybe some of you are, I don't know, I don't know what you guys are up to these days. But subhanAllah, you are going to be faced with challenges here and there. Difficulties here and there, the difficulties of this dunya. 
And we're going to all buckle on the different positions, right? But very few people will remain firm and steadfast. And those who will remain firm and steadfast, let me give you some good news. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Asa ayyabathaka rabbuka maqaman mahmuda. Allah will elevate you to a position. The position itself is praiseworthy. And imagine you get to a position that the position itself is praiseworthy. And that's why the more patient you are, the more that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates you in the dunya and elevates you in the akhirah. If it's genuine, if it's sincere. But the opposite is also true. What does Allah mention in 75? إِذَنْ لَأَذَقَنَاكَ ضِعْفَ الْحَيَاةِ وَضِعْفَ الْمَمَاتِ So, وَلَوْ لَأَنْ ثَبَّتْنَاكَ لَقَدْ كِدَّ تَرْكَنُ إِلَيْهِمْ شَيْئًا قَلِيلًا If it was not for the thabat that Allah gave you, you would have inclined even in the smallest bit. But if you did, Allah would have allowed you to experience double the punishment in the dunya and double the punishment in the akhirah. Now let me ask you this. Is the word punishment mentioned? It's not mentioned. Allah says, لَأَذَقَنَاكَ ضِعْفَ الْحَيَاةِ وَضِعْفَ الْمَمَاتِ Allah would have given you double in this life and double upon death. But the word punishment is not used, it's omitted. Because it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it's not befitting to mention the word punishment with the Prophet Muhammad because he was protected from that to begin with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it could have, but it's not even on the table as an option because you've been given that thabat. It's like when you're saying to your kid, like, oh, you were so close. You could have been double. You know what I mean? But I'm not going to say it because you, you, you passed. You did, the, you did the right thing. So it's a form of honor for Allah, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet But it means that when you're in a position of responsibility, you get what, guys? You get double the punishment as anybody else. Double the punishment in this world. You get double the humiliation. When, when an average person commits a sin versus somebody in a position of responsibility, more responsibility commits the same sin, it's double the punishment. Double the punishment, double the humiliation in this dunya, double the humiliation in the akhirah. Because your actions can set so many other, you know, cascade events in people's lives. You as you you in your in your uh, by the way when I say that I'm not just talking about the imam or the leader of the masjid I'm talking about each and every one of us we're a leader in some way you as a father you're the leader of your family so when you were young and you were you know careless and this and this and that your punishment is very different from now that you're a father because guess what you become that moral your your kid is looking at you like you're everything to them. So you slip up and you commit that mistake and, 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 and in their eyes, what, what have you done now? You've made that mistake normalized. My dad did it, so who am I? If my dad couldn't resist the temptation, how am I going to resist the temptation? If my mom couldn't resist the temptation, how am I going to resist the temptation? So you, you have to hold yourself to a higher position of responsibility and moral responsibility and commitment the more that Allah gives you in honor and marriage is a form of honor you being a team lead in your company is a form of it's a form of elevation now people look at you in a specific way right you being a volunteer even in a community where you're coming out and mashallah all the aunties are saying mashallah the barakallah beta is so good he volunteers all the time mashallah my love this beta why you'd not be like beta what happens this the minute they find out beta is not good what's gonna happen he said see you telling me you have to be like beta is this and the beta is morally corrupt i told you so this is what happens. We, we, we end up, subhanAllah, creating or we end up justifying the, the, the mistakes of others or becoming a reason that others commit mistakes. May Allah protect and forgive us, Ya Rabbi Ameen. And by the way, similar ayahs is mentioned where? In Surah Al-Ahzab, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya Nisa al-Nabi, lastunna ki ahadi min al-Nisa, in ittaqaytunna, fala taqma'ana bil qawli fa atma'a alladhi fi qalbihi marad, wa qulna qawlan, معروف وقرن في بيوتكن ولا تبرجن تبرج الجاهلية الأولى وقين الصلاة وأتين الزكاة. What's mentioned before that? يا نساء النبي من يأتي من كن بفاحشة مبينة يضاعف لها العذاب ضعفين. And then ومن يقنط من كن لله وتعمل صالحة نؤتها أجرها مرتين. So all of these ayat in Surah Al-Hazab. What are they saying? They're saying, O oh, women of the Prophet, you're not like the rest of the women. You're not held to the same standard. 
if you do good, you get double the reward because it takes much, it's, it's much harder to do good when you're in the spotlight. It's much harder. And it's also, you have the attention, so it's more likely that you can fall. So falling, you get double the punishment. Working and doing good, you get double the reward when you're in that position. And that applies to anything. You're the head of the MSA. You are uh, involved as, uh, as, as MGA members in a community. You're involved as board members in a community. You're involved as advisors. You're involved as teachers. You're involved as the, all of these positions come with that responsibility. You have to hold yourself to the highest standard and you have to push yourself to be better because double the punishment, double the reward. Keep that in mind. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to the Prophet Muhammad sallam, the way to keep this going, the way to keep yourself standing amidst all of this temptation, as we mentioned, aqim as salah. Keep the prayer standing. It'll keep you standing. Aqim as salah. Now, imagine the, the verb here, guys, is what? Aqim. Aqim. It doesn't say just pray. Aqim. You know when you're keeping something standing, how do you guys keep something standing? You got When you're building a tower and you want to keep it standing, you're very what? You're very, very careful. You build the base, build the foundation. You put every piece, it's, it's organized, it's tactical, right? You're building ground up. So the same thing with your salah. Your salah is a structure that will keep you standing. So if you don't keep that structure correct and in good form, you will not be in good form. It's imad al deen It's the core of your the foundation of your faith. That's the salah. So how you come to the salah? How you come to the salah? How you make wudu? The way that you make wudu? You're sitting. You're, you get your intention. You do your adhkar. You do your istighfar. You're you're washing in between your hands. Your finger. You're you're thinking about the sins that these hands have committed, and you ask Allah to forgive and to cleanse. Every one of those sins and to forgive every one of those sins. When you when you wash your mouth, every every single wash, you're thinking with every single gargle, Ya Allah forgive what has been mentioned by this. Any anything that I've said, anything that I've alluded to, when you do the same thing with your nose, anything that you know, if I if I put my nose up out of arrogance in the face of anybody, intended or unintended, if I even gave somebody the perception that I'm inaccessible, that I'm too good, when you wash your face. Ya Allah, these eyes and what they've seen, these, you know, this forehead and what it's done, any place where it's been or all of, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cleanse that. Your your arm, your strength, what you've done with your with your youth, with your strength, your 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 head, your intellect, right? What you've done with your hair. Your hair is a form of grace and beauty. Right? What you've what you've used your beauty, what you've used what Allah has given you for, all of these things. When you're making wudu, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cleanse all of that. So you begin with all of that cleansing. And then that's why when you enter the salah, you're naturally in a better state. You pray your sunnah beforehand. Your sunnah is like your practice marathon. You're getting into the zone. You're reading al-fatiha. You're saying Allahu Akbar. You're moving everything behind you. You're putting the world behind you. Every anxiety, insecurity, worry, all of it is behind you. When you actually do that and you get ready for the salah, and then you come and you're cleansed and you're wearing something good and you're smelling good and you create the mood. Right? And you come to the masjid and you pray. Your prayer will mean something very different. And when you know the Quran and the meanings of the Quran and the ayat and you've put in all the effort, now you've built a structure that will keep you standing. But don't come in, you know, you wake up uh, four hours late for Fajr. You're on the way to the work. Oh, I gotta do Fajr. Half of your teeth are not brushed. You're, mashallah, you're wearing your pajamas upside down, inside out. Allahu sami Allah. That's not a prayer. That's, you haven't kept your prayer standing. And that's why Nabi Sallam told that companion who came into the masjid and prayed. Quit, what did he tell him? Go back and pray for you have not prayed. Say one back again. Go back and pray for you have not prayed. Go back and pray for you have not prayed. I don't, know, I don't know how to pray. How is it that I'm going to pray? Tell me, what do I do? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallam described how you should pray. It's called the prophetic prayer. The hadith, the prophetic prayer. Read the hadith. Right? What did he say? You get into a state of standing until you're tranquil. You don't go to ruku until you've reached tranquility. Can you imagine, guys? And then when you go into ruku', you keep yourself in ruku' until you're in tranquility. And you come back 
and then you go back for sujood and you go back. Now here's the thing. You can't pray like that in the masjid because you have uncles and you have aunties. You pray like you're going to get stabbed. <laughs> I go, especially in Jama'ah, we, we got to think, you know, we, we got to keep the salah good enough that it's nice. And But where can you actually take your time and there's no pressure by anybody? There's no baby crying in the back. There's no auntie whose legs are going to crack if you take more than five minutes in the rukuah. There is no senior in the community. Because the Nabi Sallam did say, take the weakest among you as the standard when you're praying collectively. So you got to keep in mind the needs of everybody. But when are you completely free? No limitations. Qiyam. Even if you're a mother of seven. Right? At night, inshallah, there should be at least half an hour in which all of them are sleeping. <laughs> in that half an hour, to the best of your capacity, you time it, you manage it so that you get your 5, 10, 15 minutes of salah in their qiyam where you take your time where you talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where you have that genuine conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is the key to standing and withstanding the pressures of life and there's one piece of advice that you will take from all of these classes and the reflections of the Quran do not miss out on the connection to Allah at night through qiyam it is an entire new level of Iman with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially for those who really want to get into that position. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what? وَقُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ إِنَّ قُرْآنَ الْفَجْرِ كَانَ مشهودة. So begin with your salah. Do your five. Do your five. The next level, get into a position where you're present in fajr, in praying it in jama'ah. Because that is where it's witnessed. Right? It's witnessed by the angels. The angels are witnessing. وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ نَا Night, do tahajjud, do the extra prayer. عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا Because Allah may raise you to a station that is praiseworthy through that. So the Qiyam gives you that praiseworthy station. It is for the Prophet ﷺ, but it's also applicable to each and every one of us who follow in his footsteps. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ the dua to make وَقُلْ رَبِّ أَدْخِلْنِي مُدْخَلَ صِدْقٍ وَأَخْرِجْنِي مُخْرَجَ صِدْقٍ وَجْعَلْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ سُلْطَانَ النَّصِيرَ O Allah, my Lord, grant me an honorable entrance and an honorable exit and give me supporting authority from you. Give me that victory from you. So an entrance into what? An entrance into Medina, out of Mecca. An entrance in, back into Mecca, out of Medina. An entrance of any kind. Whenever you go from one phase into another, from one job into another, from one community into another, from one relationship into another, whatever it may be, whenever you're in transition, make this dua. Rabbi adikhilni mudakhala sadiqin wa akhrijini mukhraja sadiq. Allow me to exit honorably and allow me to enter honorably. Many of us, we don't leave honorably. You know where you test people is their, during their exits. You know, imagine you're exiting a job. That's it. The last two weeks on the job, what are you doing? Ah, leg on, leg on. Oh, I'm going to make sure I get every penny out of you guys. You're there leaking all the software information, confidentiality agreement. I didn't even sign it. Right? You're reading all the... You're <laughs> the doom of the company is happening at your hands. Right? But imagine how many of us exit honorably. You're there returning the amanat, thinking about subhanAllah. You're, you're training the person that is coming to take over the position. You're saying, look, if there's anything that I can do, help, initiate. Because that's who you are. That's, that's the kind of honor that you have. Right? And of course, yani, given, given the context that this is a, a good place to be and an ethical place to be. Right? So this is, this is what it means to have an honorable exit. And subhanAllah, I know, I know some, some people... Um, you, you really see this in divorces. One, one example in my mind, I'm sure you guys have seen all kinds of ugly divorces where people just forget. They forget that they were even married to begin with. It becomes very disgusting. But one example of a beautiful divorce that I've seen, subhanAllah, is where the husband and the wife mutually agreed, this is not working out. Khair. So they go on to the separate path. And the husband, because the wife is still in that position of struggle, he continues to spend on her for three years. Continues to provide and clothe and still sends, 
you know, uh, whenever the car needs to be fixed, he still sends somebody to fix the car. Whenever anything needs to be done, he's still there, present completely. And he would say to look, I know it didn't work out, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm your brother in Islam. And that we shared a family together. Of course, they're not communicating. There's no haram, right? Then there's no intimacy. There's no, but there's that respectful exchange from afar that happens through the children. So he would give his son, like, here's a thousand bucks. Give it to your mom the next time you see her. And tell her, this is from dad. And when the kids serve as that, they see mom and dad still respecting those boundaries. Subhanallah, they, it means something to them. It means something to them. How often have you seen that? You know, here's two thousand bucks, three thousand dollars. Tell your mom, inshallah, she, in case she wants to go for Umrah, use this to go for Umrah. Take you guys somewhere and just take some time. It's been a difficult few months. So there are people like that that still exist. It's rare, but it happens. You know, the, 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 the kid tells his, his dad, you know, mom's had a really bad uh, accident. The car is, don't worry. Here's the number of the mechanic. Tell her to go to the mechanic. It'll be taken care of. Put it on my tab. And, and again, I'm giving you the examples in, in the financial sense because that's usually what breaks marriages in these cases. And that's where people begin to be very ugly. But in every aspect, there are people like that. And that's the way it should be done. That's the way it should be done according to the Sharia. You show the best when things go sour. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from people who enter in a constructive way and exit in a constructive way, in an honorable way, and allow us to be given victory through him and him alone. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka natubu alayk. And we're going to be praying maghrib inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If anybody left the key, inshallah, yeah, I believe this is a uh, key here. That'll be here, inshallah, for you. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا Allah 
اشهد ان محمد رسول الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاه حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استووا استقيموا تراصوا اعتدلوا سدوا الخلل اتصلوا ولا تختلفوا الله اكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين أقم الصلاة لدلوك الشمس إلى غسق الليل وقرآن الفجر إن قرآن الفجر كان مشهودا ومن الليل فتهجد به نافلة لك عسى أن يبعثك ربك مقاما محمودا وقل رب أدخلني مدخل صدق وأخرجني مخرج صدق واجعل لي من لدنك سلطانا نصيرا وقل جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوقا وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا يزيد الظالمين إلا خسارا وإذا أنعمنا على الإنسان أعرض ونأى بجانبه وإذا مسه الشر كان يأوسا قل كل يعمل على شاكلته فربكم أعلم بمن هو أهدى سبيلا ويسألونك عن الروح قل الروح من أمر ربي 
وما أوتيتم من العلم إلا قليلا الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين دين فذلك الذي يدع اليتيم ولا يحض على طعام المسكين فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون الذين هم يراءون ويمنعون الماعون الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان رب الأعلى الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم الله أكبر الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر سبحان الله الله أكبر الله أكبر
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله 